Hello and welcome to Vantage This Week, the last one of 2023. On this show, we recap the highlights of the week gone by, the top newsmakers, the biggest events and the new, newest trends. It's been an interesting week. The Indian stock market scaled new highs. It breached the important milestone of $4 trillion in market capitalization. Only four other markets have done this. So how did India become a stock market superpower? And is it the right time to invest? Stay tuned to find out. Meanwhile, the tech industry is in turmoil. It's been rattled by mass layoffs and accusations of employee poaching. Indian giant Infosys has been pitted against Cognizant. We'll tell you why it's time to normalize poaching from rivals. In the US, Joe Biden's re-election bid looks challenging. Young Americans are disillusioned by his leadership. But could Taylor Swift save him? It wouldn't be a first. Star power has always been a key factor in politics. Over in Brazil, the unthinkable could happen. Their football team is at risk of being suspended from the FIFA World Cup. We'll tell you why. Meanwhile, Indian cinema had an excellent 2023, especially Bollywood. After a series of flops, Hindi movies topped the charts this year. We'll explain how they pulled it off. And have you ever returned an online order? I'm sure you have. If you have, you're part of a $600 billion industry. That's right, the return economy is huge. And finally, what's the deal with New Year's Day? What's all the craze about? All this and more lined up, let's get started. India has been called a stock market superpower. Indian companies are ending 2023 on a high. There's a bull run in the stock markets. If you club all publicly listed companies in India, they're worth more than $4 trillion, and mostly part of two exchanges, the Bombay Stock Exchange or BSC and the National Stock Exchange or NSE. Thousands of companies are listed on these exchanges and they're having a dream run. There is big money flowing into Indian markets. Indian companies have become more valuable. And how do you assess that? Through a company's market value. And what's that? The total value of all the shares of a company. Say there's a company called XYZ. One share of XYZ sells at 10 rupees and the company has issued 100 shares. So 100 shares will be worth 1,000 rupees. That's the market cap of XYZ. But if you want to, so if you want to buy this company XYZ, the price tag is 1,000 rupees. And when I say the Indian stock market is worth $4 trillion, it basically means the total value of all publicly listed shares is $4 trillion. Out of this, $1 trillion has been added in the last three years. So India is now part of an exclusive club. Indian stock markets are among the biggest in the world and Indian companies among the most valuable. Here's what the pecking order looks like. The Americans are right at the top. US stocks are worth more than $50 trillion, 50, 50 trillion. China comes next. It's worth over $10 trillion. Japan, $6 trillion. The Hong Kong market, around $4.56 trillion. And finally, we have India at $4.16 trillion. Now, this is an important milestone. India has touched the $4 trillion mark for the first time. And the bull run is not over yet. Hong Kong's position is under threat. Indian companies are closing in fast. The Hong Kong market, as you would know, is in turmoil. It fell by... 17% this year, all thanks to Xi Jinping and his erratic policies. And this trend is not set to reverse anytime soon. So Hong Kong will continue to sink and India could surpass Hong Kong and become the fourth biggest stock market in the world. Which brings us to the next questions. What is working for India? What is driving this bull run? Broadly, there are two factors. Number one, the surge in investment from overseas. These are foreign institutional investors or FIIs. They could be independent investors or large organizations like the international mutual funds, pension funds or investment groups. Basically the big money bags. Do you know how much they've invested in India? By December, FIIs had poured in around $18 billion into the Indian markets. They're making steady purchases. And why are they bullish on India? Because of the resilience of the Indian economy, that's the second factor. India is outperforming its global peers. In the last quarter, India reported a growth of 7.6%, which is way better than expectations. 7.6%. The earlier estimate was 6.5% by India's central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, or RBI. They'd expected 6.5%. India clocked 76 So the overall trend is looking good. 
Inflation has been largely contained. It has dropped below the 5% mark. Industrial production is high. In October, it rose by over 11%, which is a 16-month high. And the trajectory looks good. Indian stock markets are benefiting from that. Good growth is good for business, plus leading markets are delivering sluggish returns. For example, returns from U.S. bonds have dropped below 5%. What about U.S. stock markets? They deli delivered a result, a return rather, of 6%. And how did China perform? Chinese stocks gave a modest return of 2.7%. Compare that to India. This year, Indian stocks have delivered returns of more than 10%. The numbers speak for themselves. This is why India is being called a stock market superpower. It's late December, which means it's the season of forgiveness, but not for everyone. A bitter battle is unfolding in the world of software. At the center of it is talent. Let me explain. In January this year, 2023, Cognizant hired a new CEO. It's a software giant based in the US. Its new CEO is Ravi Kumar, and he's been busy. He's hired some 20 vice presidents and four senior vice presidents, most of them for, from two companies. Wipro and Infosys. Now, neither company is happy about this, Wipro and Infosys. Wipro has sued two of its departing executives. Infosys has sent a letter to Cognizant, sort of like a warning shot. Both firms are making the same accusation, that of poaching. Let's look at the definition first. Poaching is when you hire employees from your competitor, say Apple and Samsung. If Apple hires a chip specialist from, from Samsung, it's poaching. If Samsung hires a designer from Apple, it is poaching. And why is that? Because Apple and Samsung are rivals. They compete for the same market. And the choice of this term is quite interesting. Because poaching also has another meaning, the more common one. To illegally hunt or catch animals. But unlike that poaching, corporate poaching is legal. There is no law against hiring from your competitor. In fact, it's pretty common. Some studies say 30%, 3-0, 30% of all job changes are poaching, yet it is frowned upon. Companies say it's unethical and immoral, but the question is why? Companies always look out for their own profits and margins. So why shouldn't employees? I'll tell you what the problem is. It's the mindset. We've been told that company loyalty is paramount, that working for your competitor is wrong. It's basically propaganda. Most companies listen to market forces, so why shouldn't workers? The price of your work is determined by demand and supply. Higher the demand, higher the price. So companies have two options. Either pay that price or let someone else pay it. In this case, a competitor. You can't use so-called morals to tie down employees. You must put your money where your mouth is, and data supports this. Let's look at why most employees change jobs. There are two major reasons. One is for better pay. The second is for better opportunities, maybe a promotion or a new role or a better manager. In September, a survey tried to quantify these reasons. It was carried out in the United States, and look at the findings. 32% Americans switched for better pay. 23% for more opportunities. So these two reasons alone make up 55% of the reasons why people change jobs. And why is this important? Because your current employer can also do this. Just think about it. If a rival is offering you more salary, it means you're worth it. So why can't your current employer do the same? In fact, market forces require them to do so. Same with promotions or new roles. If someone else is offering it, so can your cur current employer. If they can't, they shouldn't talk about poaching. Neither should they sue or shoot letters. So what's the takeaway here? We have two of them. One, corporate leaders need to be more hands-on. Speak to your employees, understand their needs and expectations. If not, someone else will. And two, workers shouldn't feel guilty about poaching. For starters, it is legal. And secondly, you are worth it. Historically, the job market has been a buyer's market. Companies held all the cards. But that was before the digital age. It was a time when your skills and talent went under the radar, but not anymore. Today, it's impossible to hide talent, to suppress talent. Whether it's a prodigious footballer in some local Colombian league, or a skilled coder working from home, or a gifted designer at a car company, you cannot hide them anymore. Rivals will try to offer them better things. 
So our advice to companies is this, change your approach. Don't live in fear of poaching. Instead, focus on talent retention. Now let's talk about the tech sector. It isn't feeling festive. It has slowed down hirings, including in India. I'm talking about big tech, the likes of Facebook or Meta, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Netflix, Google. If you want to work for any of these companies, you'll most likely have to wait. They've cut vacancies by 90%, 9-0. Meaning if there were 100 open positions earlier, only 10 are open now. And this is quite a fall from the last few years. You see, during the pandemic, the tech sector expanded aggressively. The world moved online, so there was a glut of jobs and a growing demand for talent. It helped the employees. Their pay packages shot up. Many took up new jobs with jaw-dropping hikes. But since last year, winter has set in, the money has dried up, and tech companies are tightening their belts. The worst hit are the startups. Let me show you some data. Since 2022, more than 34,000 employees have been sacked, with 121 startups cutting their staff. This year, 69 startups fired more than 14,000 employees in India. And among these, the worst affected were those in the education space, better known as the ed tech startups, education technology. Since last year, 24 ed tech companies have fired almost 15,000 workers. So startups are cutting positions and big tech is not hiring. Do you know what that means? There is a surplus of talent, more workers, fewer jobs. As of May, close to 200,000 tech workers had been sacked in India, including from both startups and big tech. So for new graduates, getting placed is going to be tough. There will be fewer jobs available. And if you're looking to switch jobs, it will be tougher to find the right fit. Also keep your salary expectations in check because this situation may not improve anytime soon. The outlook for 2024 looks is, is bearish. Leading Indian tech companies expect less revenue. As of October, five out of seven leading companies had cut their forecasts, including Infosys, HCL, and Tata Consultancy Services, or TCS. These are the top names in outsourcing. They depend on international contracts. By extension, their success is tied to the global tech industry. But right now, there is instability worldwide and a global downturn. By October this year, seven big tech companies had lost more than $3 trillion. These are Meta, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google or Alphabet, Tesla and Microsoft. Together, their market value fell by $3 trillion. And just like their Indian counterparts, these companies have laid off thousands of workers. In 2022, more than 1,060 tech companies worldwide laid off over 160,000 workers. And this year, 2023, was worse. More than 1,100 companies sagged more than 260,000 employees. So when there is a global downturn, how can India remain immune? This turmoil has also exposed some weaknesses, overvalued companies, unsustainable startups, and a workforce with a skills crunch. And that's the most pressing issue right now, especially among the new graduates. Look at this recent survey. It covered 440,000 Indian students across 2,500 campuses, and the findings are concerning. Just 45% of these students were employable. What about the rest? Their skills need an upgrade. Today, the CEOs of leading tech companies in the world are Indians. If India wants to sustain this dominance, it must focus on upgrading its workforce faster because technology is speeding ahead, and those who can keep pace will find a place in the job market. We began 2023 with a question. Will artificial intelligence take our jobs? And we end 2023 with the same question. No answers though. Experts and corporate bosses are non-committal. They won't say yes or no, but their decisions reveal a clear trend. Just look at Google. Reports say the company is planning to reduce its workforce, basically fire people. And how many jobs are at stake? Around 30,000. That's a big number, 30,000 jobs. Google only has around 170,000 employees, so 17% of them could be fired. And what's the reason? Artificial intelligence. Google wants to use AI in its daily operations, especially in two fields. One is the ad sales department, and the second is customer support. 
Now, the ad sales is a very important department. In 2020, Google ads made around $147 billion in revenue. $147 billion. That was 80% of the company's total inflow. Then why the layoffs? Because Google thinks AI can do a better job. This year, they launched an AI-driven ad program. It's called Performance Max, and the results are good. Businesses that use this program reported 18% more conversions, meaning more people visited them thanks to the ad. Last year, without it, without AI, it was 13%. So clearly, AI helps. Same with customer support. Whether it's handling complaints or asking for reviews or seeking feedback, AI seems to be much more efficient. And Google did warn about this. In January, they laid off 12,000 workers. They said the company is refocusing, whatever that means. But Google is not alone. AI has taken hundreds of thousands of jobs in 2023. Like at IBM, the company plans to replace around 8,000 workers with artificial intelligence. Paytm fired close to 1,000 workers. Again, AI was cited as a reason. Apparently, Paytm is using AI to do repetitive tasks. Another Indian example is Dukan. It's an e-commerce platform. This year, Dukan replaced 90% of its support staff with AI, 90%. And 2024 will be more of the same. Take a look at what a US survey found. 44% companies say some jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence. 37% say AI has already taken jobs. So forget existential threats and terminator problems. This is the real risk from AI. The risk of jobs. Studies say AI could take millions of existing jobs. At the same time, it will also create millions of new ones. So the question is, what should you do? How can you prepare for these new jobs? If you're in school or college, it's time to think. Do some research, get advice from industry experts, basically figure out a strategy. And I'm not saying don't follow your dream, but see if that dream will be gobbled up by AI. Many colleges have already started adapting. For example, IIT Bombay. It has made AI and data science mandatory for students. So clearly things are moving in one direction. Make sure you are not moving in the opposite one. But what if you're already in the workforce? What do you do then? Well, then the old mantra still stands. You have to keep updating your skills, learn new techniques and methods, acquire more knowledge, keep researching and learning. Only then can you remain relevant. You can't depend on companies to protect your jobs from AI because they won't. Just look at Google. It makes around $14 billion in profit every year. That's $56 billion annually. And I'm talking pure profits, not revenue. $56 billion. Yet it's firing 30,000 workers. Can Google afford to keep them on? Of course they can. It's one of the richest companies in the world. But it won't because that's how companies function. So in 2024, we need a reset. Every stakeholder needs to review where they stand. Parents, teachers, schools, companies, headhunters, all of them. Because AI is coming for some of our jobs. And nobody can say there wasn't a warning. Here's another example of India's strategic autonomy, its relationship with Russia. It has remained solid despite pressure from the West and despite Moscow's growing proximity to China. But why are we talking about this tonight? Because India's external affairs minister is in Moscow. S. J. Shankar landed in Moscow yesterday. He began the trip on a nostalgic note, a visitor's pass from 1962. The minister shared it. There was a reception for Soviet cosmonauts at Moscow's Red Square and Jay Shankar attended the event as a six-year-old in 1962. And now, more than six decades later, he's back in Moscow as India's foreign minister and on a more important mission. Jay Shankar is filling in for the Indian Prime Minister. Prime Minister Modi was supposed to visit Russia for his annual summit with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. He couldn't go. So he sent S. J. Shankar, who started the visit, on the perfect note. Here's what he said. If there is one constant uh, actually in world politics, it has actually been the relationship with India-Russia. The only constant in world politics. The choice of words is telling. India and Russia share a long history. And despite recent geopolitical pressures, India's commitment to Russia has not wavered. However... There, there is a need for recalibration. Progress on key diplomatic initiatives remains stalled. 
and Minister S. Jayashankar is trying to revive that. Today he met Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, and he was quick to spell out India's priorities. The first one is trade. Trade remains lopsided in Russia's favor, mainly because India buys Russian oil, and a lot of it. New Delhi wants to strike a balance, and Moscow is game. They plan to sign a trade deal. We have agreed that the negotiations between India and the Eurasian Economic uh, Union uh, for a free trade agreement will be resumed in the second half of January this year. A free trade pact. This includes five countries, Russia, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Now, India and Russia will resume talks next month. There's a lot to address on that front. One of the key concerns is currency. Eight months ago, there was a setback. India and Russia wanted to trade in their native currencies, the rupee and the ruble. India paid for Russian weapons in rupees. But the effort has been stalled because Russia has a lot of Indian rupees and doesn't know what to do with them. We're talking about significant assets in rupees worth billions. Russia doesn't know how to use them. The money cannot be converted because Russia faces international sanctions. Its banking systems are cut off from the world. Plus, they have limited investment options in India and they don't buy very much from India. So they cannot use the rupees to pay for imports. Hence the large stockpile. And it's not like they did not look for solutions. Both sides were in talks. But in May this year, the conversation seems to have hit a dead end. Now, when the trade negotiations begin, they can revisit the currency issue because many more big ticket deals are in the works, including deals in Russian weapons. And that's the second priority. Lavrov made a statement today. He said India and Russia want to make more weapons together. We respect and we have spoken about this, the desire of our Indian colleagues to diversify ties in the area of military technical cooperation. We also understand and are ready to support their initiative to produce military products within the framework of the Make in India program. What kind of weapons? Military aircraft. Russia isn't revealing what kind. But it won't be the first project of this nature. India's BrahMos missile was made in collaboration with Russia. Russia has also partnered with India for the Sukhoi fighter jets, tanks, armored vehicles and shells. And this year, India and Russia began the joint production of Kalashnikov rifles. Again, these projects were delayed due to the war in Ukraine and also because of Western sanctions. But that has not hampered future engagements and new proposals. And it seems that India is still willing to be patient, even when it comes to nuclear cooperation. India and Russia have signed new agreements. This is about the Kurankulam nuclear power plant, India's largest nuclear power station. India wants to build more power units there, and Russia seems ready to help. So defense and energy are the backbone of this relationship. If the trade deal materializes, it will only deepen mutual dependence. Although India has scaled back the purchase of Russian oil, in October it fell to an eight-month low. That's because discounts from Russia fell. So India started buying less. But the larger picture remains unchanged. Later today, Jay Shankar is expe expected to meet the Russian president as well. And today's developments only underscore Russia's importance for India. Moscow remains a time-tested friend for New Delhi. For our last story tonight, let's talk about Joe Biden. The US president has had a terrible year. Two wars, economic wars, and all-time low ratings. That's 2023 for Joe Biden. If there's anyone who wants to forget this year, it's probably Joe Biden. But will he be looking forward to 2024? It's the year of the US presidential election, and Biden needs a lifeline to remain in the White House. Will that lifeline be Taylor Swift? She's arguably the most popular person in America right now. Over half of all Americans call themselves Swifties. And experts say an endorsement from, from SWIFT could shift the political tide in the U.S. But will Miss Americana do it? Also, what is it about stars that they influence politics? Our next report tells you. 2023 was the year of Taylor Swift. She was Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Her era's tour earned over $1 billion. Her fans caused a mini earthquake. And wherever she went, there were only tremors. So much so that Justin Trudeau begged her to visit Canada. If Taylor Swift were an economy, she would be bigger than many countries. So when Beyonce asks who runs the world, 
we can safely say it's Taylor Swift. She is a cultural phenomenon, the biggest pop star of her generation. But can she also influence elections? We ask because 2024 is the year of US presidential elections. And at this point, it could be a 2020 rematch. Biden versus Trump. Can Taylor change the way America votes? Well, there is precedence for this. Taylor Swift identifies as a Democrat. She's often talked about not speaking against Trump in 2016. In 2018, she endorsed two candidates in Tennessee, both Democrats. One of them won, the other did not. In 2020, she supported Biden's presidential bid. Many could argue the impact of her endorsements. But the Taylor Swift of 2020 isn't the Taylor Swift of today. She was a pop star back then. Today, she is a cultural icon. She has young America at her beckoning. When she speaks, her fans listen. And they listen hard. Like this post. Taylor Swift posted it in September. She asked her fans to register to vote. What happened next was unprecedented. There was a spike in registrations. The most registrations in a day since 2020. So a simple endorsement could do wonders for Biden, especially in the swing states. Because while Taylor is a Democrat herself, she is extremely popular among independents and Democrats. A recent poll said she had the highest favorability rating, putting her above Biden, Trump or any other political person in America. Nearly half of all Swifties are millennials, a voter base Biden is struggling with. So a simple shout-out could mean lines at the ballot box. Even if a fraction of her followers turn up to vote, it would mean tens of thousands of people. And that could change the tide for Biden. And it's happened before. Star power can influence elections. Take the 2008 US elections. Oprah Winfrey endorsed Barack Obama. Apparently, it helped Obama gain over a million votes. In 1984, Indian actor Amitabh Bachchan contested the Lok Sabha elections from Allahabad. He won with a record margin of 1,87,895 votes. Then, there were the 1996 Tamil Nadu state elections. Superstar Rajnikanth was campaigning. He said, even God can't save Tamil Nadu if Jay Lalita returns to power. And just like that, Jay Lalita's AIA-DMK suffered a crushing defeat winning just four assembly seats out of 234. So, star power matters. They can really shift the tide in your favour. They can help you reach a wider audience, help you convey your message better. But what happens when they are not as politically nuanced? Take comedian Kenny Everett. He was at a Tory conference in 1983, speaking for Margaret Thatcher. It did not go so well for her, given that Everett called for bombing Russia. So, what will it be for Taylor Swift? Will Taylor decide she belongs to the Democrats? Can she help Biden shake the election's blues off? Will their love story woo the voters? Or will it just be another cruel summer of campaigning for the Biden camp? Taylor Swift came to the rescue of many economies in 2023. In 2024, can she and will she do the same for Biden? When I say Football World Cup, which is the one team that comes to your mind? If you're a Messi fan, the answer will be Argentina. But if you're a football fan, the answer should be Brazil. It is a team that has redefined the World Cup. Playing all editions and lifting the trophy a record five times, you can't imagine the FIFA World Cup without Brazil. Or can you? We ask because it's a possibility. Brazil is in a new dispute with FIFA. This one is over the dismissal of the president of its footballing body. And if it doesn't abide by FIFA's terms, Brazil could be banned from international competitions. Does that mean Brazil will miss the 2026 FIFA World Cup? Our next report has the answer. In the vast tapestry of football glory, if there's one nation synonymous with the World Cup, it's Brazil. When Brazil play, the world watches. When they win, the world celebrates. And when they lose, hearts break across the globe. But what happens if Brazil don't 
play in the World Cup. It sounds like a bad nightmare for fans, but it could soon be a possibility. Brazil could be banned from international competitions by FIFA, the likes of the Copa America or even the World Cup. So why could Brazil be banned? The story involves the Brazilian Football Confederation or the CBF. The body is going through some difficult times. It began with the departure of Ednaldo Rodriguez, the president of the body. Rodriguez was removed on December 7th. This was by a Rio de Janeiro court. It ruled that there were irregularities in his election, so it ordered his removal. The court has also asked for the election of a new president. But this did not go down well with FIFA. Historically, FIFA doesn't like interferences into its bodies, so it warned the CBF. If they conducted elections without FIFA's approval, Brazil could face suspension from international competitions. And we're talking about a few of them the 2024 Copa America, the Copa Libertadores, and even the 2026 FIFA World Cup. For now, FIFA and the South American football authority, CONMEBOL, say they will form a commission. The matter will be discussed with Brazil on January 8th. The commission will meet stakeholders, examine the current situation, and work together to find a solution. That's what FIFA says. But if Brazil acts before that, FIFA may look at a suspension. And this isn't the first time FIFA has threatened this. In 2022, FIFA threatened to ban Tunisia. This was after the country's sports minister spoke about dissolving the football association. FIFA has also banned countries before. It banned both Kenya and Zimbabwe. This was due to governmental interference in football bodies. Then there was Indonesia in 2015. FIFA alleged third-party interference in the local football association. This was the same reason why it also banned Kuwait in 2016. So it has happened before. But Brazil is no Kuwait nor Indonesia. Its name echoes through the annals of World Cup history. This is a country that has lifted the cup five times in 1958, 1962, 1970, 1994 and 2002. It's also the only team to compete in all World Cup editions. Pele, Zico, Ronaldo, these legends didn't just play the World Cup, they defined football itself. This is a country where football isn't just a game, it's a cultural phenomenon. So leaving the La Salacao out will be a massive jolt to football and its fans. FIFA says they hope to resolve the matter soon. Hopefully, we will see the men in yellow and green return in 2026 for another shot at footballing glory. How will you remember 2023? I know how the, the Indian film industry will remember it as the comeback year and a much needed comeback too. During the pandemic, Indian cinema was struggling, production houses were shut, theatres were closed, so the audience turned to, to streaming platforms like Netflix or Amazon Prime. As a result, Indian movies lagged behind. Your normal everyday stories did not pull in the audience. They wanted something more, a bit of an X factor. Some movies did give them that in 2022, like KGF2 or RRR. But those were South Indian films. Bollywood, on the other hand, struggled. We've compared the numbers. The highest grossing Bollywood film in 2022 made 430 crore rupees. KGF2 made 1,250 crore rupees, around three times more. Many people thought it was game up. They said Bollywood must adapt or perish. Well, they have adapted. Look at the top 10 grocers of this year. Six of them are from Bollywood, including the top four. Why do you think that is? For starters, the formula has changed. Everyday stories are out, big budgets are in. That's something the pandemic taught us. People go to theatres for a visual experience. They want to be wowed. Just look at the top three grocers of this year, Jawan, Patan and Animal. Look at their making budgets. More than 150 crore rupees each. In fact, nine out of the top ten movies cost more than 150 crore rupees. So the message from the audience is quite clear. Spend more to earn more. If you give us everyday stories, we will wait for the OTT version. And you can't blame them. In early days, movie halls had a pull factor, great screens, stunning sounds. You couldn't get that experience at home. But now that pull is not enough. 
because televisions and speakers have improved a lot. Some have become cost efficient. So you need something extra to pull people into cinema halls. Bollywood realized that this year, hence the numbers. And why just Bollywood? Every Indian movie industry has realized that. We hear about the success of KGF and RRR. That doesn't mean every South Indian movie was a hit. Dozens of them flopped at the box office. The difference is a lot of us don't hear about it. So my point is, it is a nationwide trend. Movies can't be pastime anymore. They must blow you away. Of course, there are exceptions like OMG2 or the Kerala story. But not every movie can replicate that success. It's not a bankable strategy anymore. We also saw another trend in 2023, A-listers turning to streaming. I know it, it may sound innocuous, but if you're an actor, how, how does it make a difference? How does scream, streaming or the big screen make a difference? Well, it does. Streaming is new and widely available. So early on, it was looked down upon. I'll give you an example. Last year, actor John Abraham was asked about OTT, whether he would work for steam, streaming platforms or not. Do you know what he said? He said he's a big screen hero, that he doesn't want to be available for 299 rupees. Well, things have changed now. We've seen many A-listers joining streaming, like Saif Ali Khan, Ajay Devgan, Madhuri Dixit, Shahid Kapoor, Alia Bhatt. All of them have worked on streaming platforms. I guess it's been normalized and moving forward, maybe even mainstreamed. But the question is, what next? Will everyone start making big budget action movies? If they do, the audience will go, grow tired of that as well. Just look at Marvel movies. Same style, same budget, same recipe. It worked for almost 10 years, but the new movies have not done well at the box office. So you can't take the audience for granted. The key is to adapt, to give them something new and interesting. If not, they will look elsewhere. It was OTT during the pandemic. It could be artificial intelligence next. Do you know what's great about December? The end of year sales. E-commerce websites are a shopper's paradise right now. Let's say you decide to treat yourself. You order a pair of shoes online. They arrive, you take the lid off the box, untie the laces and try wearing the shoes. But they don't fit. So after the initial shock, you request to return them. It is disappointing, but the shoes have never been worn. They're brand new. So at least they'll be back on the shelf. No harm, no foul, right? Wrong. Do you know what happens to the things we order online but don't keep? What happens to the purchases we return? Every time you hit that return button, an unseen reverse supply chain comes to life. The returns logistics industry. It is worth $627 billion. Its basic job is to sort out the returns, see what is salvageable and what is waste. But it's a tough one. That new pair of shoes you send back, it's not defective. But it has an open box and untied laces. Someone will have to put it together. Sometimes companies don't have the technology or the time to handle that. And even if they did, returns are shipped, driven and flown all over the world, sometimes quite a few times for a single item. So returns are expensive for sellers. They often cost more than the items themselves. So companies get rid of them. They try selling the returns cheaply to discounters. For instance, the people who will sell a truckload of TVs for $2,000. This is the most profitable option for returns. But that strategy does not work with all items, especially apparel. So there's a quicker way to handle matters, like dumping the returns in landfills. It may sound absurd, but this is the reality. With a simple click on return button, treasure turns to trash, only because it was the wrong color or size. It ends up in landfills. Everyone is not part of the problem, like the Japanese. They seldom return anything. Unlike the Americans, they are the world's leading purchase returners. They return about 20% of all online purchases. The Americans, every year Americans return about three and a half billion products, out of which only 20% are actually defective. Last year they returned products worth $816 billion, and that is more than the US defense budget. Let that sink in. 
Now, America may be the biggest, but it's not the only contributor. Germans return more than half of what they buy online. 25% of the UK's online orders are returned, same for India. This is a global problem. And it has given birth to an invisible scam, an organized retail crime. It's called wardrobing. Shoppers buy something only to wear it once and then return it. Like buying an expensive dress to wear on Christmas and returning it afterwards. Wardrobing is so common, it makes up about half of the returns and it doesn't apply to just clothes. A forest's worth of artificial Christmas trees are returned every January. In America, there's a surge in large screen TV returns after the Super Bowl. This may seem harmless, but it costs retailers money, over $10 for every $100 worth of returns. And this is terrible for the environment. Every year, 5 billion pounds of waste is generated through returns. The transportation creates a huge carbon footprint. America's returns alone generate 16 million metric tons of carbon emissions and 9.5 million pounds of landfill waste each year. That is enough to fill 10,000 Boeing 747 planes. Consumers are partly to blame, yes. Many are quick to buy and quicker to return. Most are unaware of the repercussions. But companies are also at fault here. Over the past few years, they have made returns seamless and free to boost sales. Only this year, retailers finally passed some costs of returns to consumers. Now, stores like H&M and J.Crew charge a fee. Amazon has also started charging $1 per return, but this barely stops anyone from returning purchases. These are e-commerce giants. We're talking about masterminds of supply chains and data analytics. They can do so much more. They can make return logistics transparent. They can speed up the return and refund process. That way, retailers will wait lesser. Fewer returns will end up in landfills and consumers will also be happy. Companies have great logistics when it matters to them. They know who buys what and when, where their eyes are, where the cursor follows. They have made it so easy to help consumers part with their money. Why not introduce the same level of sophistication when people want to part with their purchase? After extreme food, let's talk about an extreme sport, the New Year's Eve. It is touted as a juncture of hope and renewal, of fresh starts and a clean slate. In fact, superstition is that if the New Year's Eve is appalling, then that's how the next year is going to be. So there is immense pressure, not just to participate, but to do it right. And the movies agree. They show a New Year's Eve full of intrigue with attractive people in sparkly outfits strutting off to vacation spots. It looks so exciting, we oblige. But the reality looks different. Because if you had the idea to travel, so did thousands of others. This is what Indian hill stations look like right now. Manali is one of the worst hit. Over 65,000 tourists entered the hilly town just on Christmas Day. 65,000 people, they began their long vacation by causing a traffic nightmare. There were few who avoided the jam. They took the road not taken, quite literally, by driving through a river. But hill stations aren't the only ones taking a hit. Other vacation hotspots like Jaipur are also congested. भाई ये छः घंटे से हम जाम में खड़े हैं जयपुर में और ये जाम कोई सीमा नहीं इंडिया इज हार्डली दी ओनली वन विद ट्रेवल सर्ज इन चाइना ट्रेवल एंथुसियाजम इज लाइक नो अदर After three years of restrictions, the Chinese are unleashing their party energy. Year end travel bookings have risen by and wait for it 465% compared to last year. That's the spike, 465%. Train bookings have surged by 194%. During New Year's weekend, 1.5 million people will cross China's border with tourists celebrating in China and the Chinese vacationing abroad. America is a travel hotspot too. In this last week of December, people are flocking in to see the ball drop. 
and 115 million Americans are traveling, a 2.2% increase compared to last year. It seems like the entire world has plans, especially if we, we were to believe social media. New Year's Eve is like that extroverted party guest. You see it once a year, it arrives super late. No matter how exhausted you are after a long year, it demands that you turn up the music. And the night usually ends with regrets about not having a good time or remorse about having too much of a good time. No matter what you do, there's a good chance New Year's Eve will be terrible. According to a 1999 study, the harder people try to make New Year's Eve fun, the more dissatisfied they are. Study after study underscores this concept. Forcing yourself to be happy is the surest way to be miserable. The pressure to have a good time is so huge, the end result is usually underwhelming, if not downright depressing, which makes sense. The newness we hope for is only ours to construct. January 1st is just a number after all. And it's not everyone's number of choice either. The Chinese New Year is in February next year. Ethiopians will celebrate theirs in September. Many Muslims will celebrate it in July. And in India, a New Year is celebrated on nine different dates due to the cultural diversity. Not just the date, but the manner of celebration differs too. Many Indians light lamps, the Danish smash plates, Brazilians eat lentils, the Spanish eat grapes, and South Americans walk with empty suitcases. So before you welcome new beginnings, here's some food for thought. This New Year's Eve, allow yourself to do what you want, travel or party, only if you want to. But also know that there's nothing wrong with a low-key ceremony at home. Call it an early night. Or if you're a parent, argue about bedtime with your children till midnight. And if that doesn't cut it, smash plates, eat grapes, or light a lamp. Whatever works for you. But most of all, take off the pressure. A New Year's Eve is as much about renewal as it is about changing digits from 2023 to 2024. And if that is all the change that you want to celebrate, you do you.